Hideaki Anno. If you're capable of naming three or more anime directors, then he's probably one of them. You've heard of him because he created and directed Neon Genesis Evangelion, one of the most influential, infamous, and acclaimed anime series of all time. If you hang around in anime communities or watch and read a lot of analytical content, then you've probably seen him quoted, misquoted, speculated about, praised, and derided countless times in equal measure. What you may not have been treated to much of is the big picture. Who is this guy? What's his deal? Now, obviously, I am not Hideaki Anno, nor have I ever spoken to the man. I don't even live in his country nor understand his language. Everything that I'm going to say about him is speculative, as a consumer of all of his work and all of the information about him that I could find in English, and should be taken with a dash of salt. I'm going to try and paint a picture of Hideaki Anno as a director and on some level as a person by way of how I understand him, based on his work, his statements, and the way that he is presented by those closest to him. Hopefully, if nothing else, this will give you something to think about and shed some light on what this guy has been trying to do creatively over the last 35 years. For an anime director, and for a guy who doesn't do a lot of interviews, Anno's career and personality have been impressively well documented. Studio Kara, a studio which he founded, contains a pretty extensive bio page detailing his entire life as an artist on its website. His early career was mostly characterized by his being one of the co-founders and main creative forces behind Studio Gainax, whose formation has been extensively documented not only by its members, but metaphorically in the OVA series that they put together called Otaku no video, and in the semi-autobiographical manga-cum-TV drama series Blue Blazes, which was written by an artist who went to college with the founding members of Gainax and observed their formation from the sidelines. In 1999, Anno starred in an episode of a TV series called Extracurricular Lessons with Senpai, in which he was brought in to teach a sixth grade class at the elementary school that he once attended on how to make animation. In the process, the kids ended up going to Anno's hometown and meeting his parents and people he grew up with to get an idea of what he was like as a kid. After Anno married popular manga artist Moyoko Anno in 2002, she went on to write a single volume manga series about their married life called Insufficient Direction in 2005. All told, there's more secondhand information about Hideaki Anno in existence than there is of possibly anyone else in the anime industry. Not to mention that he makes cameo appearances in shows like Shirobako, giving further interpretations of his character. And all of it creates a pretty clear portrait of what he's generally like. If there are three things which every single account of Anno's personality have made abundantly clear and which are vitally important to understanding his work, then they are as follows. Firstly, that Hideaki Anno is otaku. Not just an otaku, he is one of the otaku, to the point that he was legitimately one of the earliest people to popularize the term as something that people called themselves and to refer to himself as such openly. Secondly, that Anno is extremely socially awkward and most likely on some level autistic. I'm not making that up. Anno himself has made statements to the effect that not only might he be autistic, but that anyone working in animation might be autistic on some level as well. And I would say that this comes through both in the way that he's portrayed in others' work, as well as in some of the characters in his own writing that he relates himself to, such as Shinji Ikari. Lastly, though this may not be quite as important to grasping his work, Anno has a very low opinion of himself, in addition to having grappled with depression for a lot of his life. It would seem by many accounts that Anno became a lot more stable after getting married, but he's clearly never been one to speak very highly of himself or of his own work. Anno's career path towards working in animation was more than a little unusual for the time, starting after his acceptance into an arts college in 1980. While Anno had been deeply invested in animation and tokusatsu shows and had been drawing manga since middle school, he was by no accounts a diligent student and didn't really think much of himself as a talented individual. If anything, it seems as though Anno's talents, having manifested in his work producing a fan-made live-action Ultraman film for school using himself as Ultraman and doing key animation work for Superdimensional Fortress Macross as an understudy, got him scouted by his peers. Anno ended up working on the classic Daikon animations with the small team put together by Toshio Okada in the early 80s and discovered the joys of working with a team and being given directorial powers, thus leading him into the career path of an animator. His first work to get him recognized was when he answered an ad by one Hayao Miyazaki over at Studio Ghibli, which was looking for key animators in the course of the tumultuous production of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Miyazaki was so impressed with Anno's animation that he handed him some of the biggest cuts in the film, and the two have seemingly enjoyed a friendly 
friendly relationship ever since. After bouncing around doing key animation work at different studios for a while, often sleeping in those studios as well, and at some point getting kicked out of college for failing to pay his tuition, Anno found himself at the formation of Gainax, working on the Royal Space Force film, before taking up his first directing job on Gunbuster when the OVA series found itself without a director early into its production in the late 80s. The image that I get of Anno in the first decade of his career is that of an immensely talented but totally directionless guy who just kind of managed to fall into a job as an animator and eventually as a director. Bear in mind that most people move through the anime industry by going up ranks in the production chain, often starting as key animators before becoming episode and animation directors and eventually working their up to a major directorial position. You could say that Anno did this to some extent, but compared to most people, he didn't really do a lot of work in his early career and bounced between studios and productions to an unusual degree. The fact that he became a director so early on could most probably be attributed to the way that Gainax was founded, being as it was one of the only anime studios which didn't form by breaking away from an older existing studio, but just kind of sprung up on its own by way of hard work and guts. I think this is important to understand because it explains why Anno never seemed to be willing to sit still across his career, and gives perspective both to his influences as well as to some of his infamous quotes. Hideaki Anno was never really just an anime guy. He was always big into special effects work and live action film, along with other mediums outside of animation. It just happened that the best connections he made and the places that needed his talents the most at the time were anime studios. All things considered, it really wasn't all that far into Anno's anime career that things started going south for him. Not long after finishing Gunbuster, Anno was given Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water, as a project handed down from a TV network after having originally been conceptualized by Hayao Miyazaki. Given that Nadia is a loose adaptation of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, it isn't difficult to imagine that it might have been a world masterpiece theater concept, given Miyazaki's involvement with that series throughout the 80s and given the overall style and tone of Nadia. Whatever the case, Nadia's production turned out to be hellish for Anno, as he found himself with little creative control over the project thanks to its producers, and the plot and production totally went off the rails in the later episodes, ending in a train wreck. Around this time, Anno and his team at Gainax tried to launch all kinds of projects which were never able to get off the ground, including an ambitious sequel to the Royal Space Force which crashed and burned after years of work in the early 90s. This is the period in which Anno fell into his infamous depression, which mythically spawned the creation of Neon Genesis Evangelion. But I think the entire image here is rather fascinating. If the journey had ended here, then Gainax would have been just a very ambitious group of young animators who somehow went beyond the impossible for a brief and glorious period before totally imploding with the rest of Japan during the economic collapse of the 90s. However, by some completely insane stroke of luck, they managed to make Evangelion. Believe it or not, I think it's often understated just how big of a deal the existence of Ava really was. To put it into perspective, Ava was practically the genesis of the new idea of original TV anime. Up until the mid-90s, TV anime was basically never created without an existing source material, unless it was being made by Studio Sunrise in order to sell robot toys. All of the big original ideas were relegated mostly to OVAs and films, which were booming throughout most of the 80s, but became difficult to find the budget for in the early 90s. Franchises like Gundam and Macross were supported by their ability to sell endless robot toys, as were the more child-oriented Sunrise shows like the Brave series. But while Evangelion did indeed feature some of the most memorable and kick-ass robots of anime history, it's plain to see that Ava was cast from a different mold compared to other original TV anime that existed at the time. Plus, there's only like three robots that would actually make decent toys. And that, as it would happen, was the entire impetus behind creating it. Anno and the producers who funded Ava thought that what anime needed was a big original TV series that wasn't based on any pre-existing work to help revitalize the medium from its slow decay over the course of the early 90s. So that's exactly what they set out to make. Anno was given carte blanche to do whatever the hell he wanted with the series for once, and he seemingly brought in every talented person he'd ever caught wind of to put their marks on the series in one way or another. Ava was designed out the gate to be a big deal, and while it wasn't necessarily much of one through the early part of its airing, it most certainly became one in the long run. 
It's hard to imagine that the Bay Papas boys would have broken off from Sailor Moon to go make Revolutionary Girl Utena, or that Sunrise would have given Shinichiro Watanabe permission to do whatever he wanted with Cowboy Bebop as long as it had spaceships in it, or that someone would have greenlit Serial Experiments Lane or Martian Successor Nadesco had Evangelion not become the whirlwind success that it eventually was. While it may not have done much for Anno at the time, and in fact he fell into an even deeper depression immediately after finishing Ava, his intentions of revitalizing TV anime were totally successful, and a whole new era of animation really did begin with the release of this series. Were I to simplify what I think Ava did that was so special as to be such a game changer for the medium, I believe that it represented a focal point at which everything that came before collided and then took one step further. Evangelion was what it was because of whom Hideaki Anno was at the time. He was a hardcore otaku, so he took elements from all of his favorite shows like Space Runaway Ideon, Mobile Suit Gundam, and Space Battle Battleship Yamato, and others from his favorite manga such as Devilman and Getter Robo, and others from his favorite tokusatsu films such as Godzilla and Ultraman, and he tossed in the influence of live-action sci-fi films like 2001 A Space Odyssey, twisted it all up in his own obsessions from power lines to infrastructure, and in his mental hang-ups from his depression down to his inability to communicate with others, and he packaged it all in an unforgettable presentation with as much talent behind it as might have existed in TV anime at the time. In short, the man created a goddamn masterpiece, but like any masterpiece, the series was entrenched in problems. Anno and his team were constantly reworking and rewriting it, even during production, at times because it was not finished, and at times because of things like a sarin gas attack on a Tokyo subway that forced them to change the nature of a major subplot. Their show got too graphic for its time slot and had to move later into the night, while the production was falling behind schedule and crumbling in their hands, forcing them to resort to more and more recap footage, and eventually to scrap their incomplete work on the last two episodes to create entirely new ones from scratch, resorting to an insane, rambling, esoteric monologue set to practically no animation. It's in this period of Anno's history where a lot of his complicated and controversial quotations come from. Anno was adamantly defensive of the last two episodes of the Ava TV series, even though it's obvious that they weren't what he intended them to be. You can see unfinished key animation from End of Evangelion right there in the next episode preview from episode 24. It's not like they planned to end the series on a total clusterfuck. Taking time away from the series and watching it bloom into success afforded Gainax the opportunity to expand on the ending and to bring it to even bigger life with the end of Evangelion. So in a way, the failure of the last two episodes may have been a blessing in disguise. I think that Anno was glad that in the end there were these two variable versions of the ending which represented both the ideal and the painfully real versions of what was going on with the series at the time. Anno has been called a troll for the way that he said things like how Evangelion has no meaning, but you can find quotes from the same period which more suggests that Anno was hoping for the audience to find meaning for themselves rather than seeking it from him. Time and again, Anno says not only of Ava but of art in general that its purpose is to communicate and that he wishes for people to be able to gain an understanding of him through his art. For someone who doesn't really know how to communicate with people directly, he tries to speak through visual mediums and he deems his success to be in how well his viewers understand him. In a sense, I wonder if it would even be depressing for someone to ask him what he means by something when his entire hope is that he's communicated his meaning through his work. Some of his quotations indicate that he was more satisfied than not with the response that Ava got, though he would incorporate the death threats which he received from some fans into the end of Evangelion film itself. He would regard the production of Ava as something like a musical improv session in some interviews, even though the actual story of the series is solidly airtight through and through. And in spite of how he called the show meaningless at some point, Anno wrote a pretty lengthy piece about the themes of the series when he announced the rebuild of Evangelion in 2006, but this video is getting long, so we're gonna have to talk about that more in part two. Thanks again for watching.